Greetings with lovers everywhere. I'm E-Train and welcome to E-Train Talks. And today is a fantastic day to be here. Also, hi. Um, I'm beyond grateful for being able to talk to so many incredible authors. But today, I cannot even begin to tell you how excited I am to be sitting down virtually with one of my hands down, all time favorite storytellers. I'm bursting with excitement right now because I have the honor I'm sure, yeah, sorry. Um, I have the honor of interviewing the award-winning and New York Times best-selling author and storytelling legend whose books always entertain, inspire, educate, and touch readers' hearts. My personal writing hero, Gordon Corman. I have all his books right here and I'm super excited to talk with him and all that we also also uh, there's this website called protable gordon corman's so cool and awesome that it, that the website has its own question dedicated to his books and you know that i beat my friends on that question because i knew it immediately and yeah i'm just so happy to be able to talk to d gordon it's an honor e-train it's an honor right back i've been following you on social media for a while and uh, i i'm excited plus i know you interviewed james ponty already and i'm definitely not falling behind james ponty so <laughs> uh, this should just kind of even us up yeah you're certainly at his level if not more don't tell him i said that you've written <laughs> over a hundred books 101 is coming out pretty soon the super teacher project yes and You've done it all. Your books have sold over 35 million copies. That's a lot for those who don't know math. <laughs> and his most recent story, The Fort, was his 100th book. And like nearly all of his stories, it tackled important issues like domestic abuse, family, and friendship. And just to name a few, here are all the books that I've read by Gordon. Mas the Mastermind series, very good and unique. The Slacker books, Super Gifted, Unplugged, Linked, War Stories, The Fort, Notorious, and This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall. And that's just a few of them. Gordon is an inspiration, and now let's jump into the first question. Jump. Um, your journey into writing for middle grade is one of the most interesting and inspiring stories I've heard. And I don't want to give too much away of your story, but in short, I read that in the wonderful... I read in the wonderful anthology, Hope Wins, that you wrote your first middle grade story. I'm talking with my hands a lot. You wrote your first middle grade story, This Can't Be Happening, at McDonald Hall when you were in seventh grade. And it was for a school project with a substitute teacher who happened to be your PE teacher. Okay, everyone's intrigued now. Will you tell us about your quest into publishing your very first book? Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't. he wasn't even a substitute teacher. It was just because... Um, I don't know. I don't know what it's like at, at your school, but I, I find like middle school schedules are just way too complicated. And and mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the way it shook out, the the only available adult to cover our class in that hour was this guy, you, you know, this, this coach. So nice guy, really good teacher. Uh, but at that time, it was his first year teaching and he'd never taught English in his life. So when it came to creative writing, he just really didn't know what to tell us to do. And what he said was the equivalent of work on whatever you want for the rest of the year. We're going to write a novel. We're going to you know, write a chapter a week and an outline the first week. But it was basically just, you know, keep on, you know, fill, fill the rest of the year creative writing wise with this one project. Right. So, um you know, at first I started working on it in class because what choice did I have, right? That's yeah. what we're doing. Uh, I got into it. My story kind of, you know, took off, started bringing it home, you know, working on it at night. And the result was, was this can't be happening at McDonald Hall. So check this out. You know what grade I got on my first book? B plus. So they gave me A plus on the actual story of it but they deducted one grade for messiness. And that was kind of not that unusual because I was in middle school in the 1970s. And back then, like you couldn't write on a Chromebook or, or an iPad. I mean, I wrote the whole thing in, in cursive. Whoa, that whole thing? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I you know one of those uh those old school composition books, they, yeah. you know, like the marble notebook, but, um, so 
at the time I was the class monitor for scholastic book orders, right? Like back in the day, they used to let a kid run scholastic. So uh, if you think about it, I had their address, right? Cause it's printed on the scholastic book order forms. I just mailed my project to the address on the book order sheets. <laughs> You're kind of looking at me like that works. Um, I got lucky, you know, the guy at Scholastic who opened up my packet, found the project. Now, I didn't send in, you know, like the composition book full of scribbles. Uh, truth, I got my mom to type it for me. So to, to this day, I have absolutely no idea if I ever would have become a writer if she had said no. Right. But nice mom. She, she didn't. Um, and that's what the guy at Scholastic read. He liked it kicked it over to his boss. She liked it. And a few days after my 13th birthday, so at that point I was uh, an eighth grader, I signed a contract for that that first book. Wow. That is a very interesting story about a story. Like yeah. That well, it was, and it, you know, the thing about it too is it's, I mean, it's just I, I, a lot of things kind of, we're lucky, right? I mean, like a lot of sort of fluky, you know, I'm not saying it wasn't a good book or I didn't do a good job, but it was also, it also required a lot of being in the right place at the right time and things just kind of falling into place. Well, I know that Scholastic wasn't a very big publisher at the time. Would, would kids with ideas in the back of their minds or composition books full of words, would that be able to work if they're in the right place at the right time right now? It would probably be harder, right? Just because, uh, you know, everything gets harder as, yeah. as, you know, so it's really hard to find a publisher without an agent these days. And, and you know, which, which is not to say that it doesn't happen, but, um, but a lot of kids who become writers uh, tend to follow different routes now. Like they, they post stuff on Wattpad. They, you know, they tend to go the online route. Yeah. And, and, and once you're online, I mean, you know, like there's always the chance that someone's going to be like, oh, I was like leafing through a bunch of fanfic and I found this thing this guy wrote. And, and that that applies to adults too, right? Any any beginning writer, it, it's just really hard to get your foot in the door and you require that little bit of luck. Well, I'm super glad that your luck went through the roof because without this can't be happening at mcdonald hall we might not have all 100 of your books to read and fun fact i was introduced to your world of entertaining reads a few years ago because my mom during covid was like scouring the interwebs searching for books i might like to read and she spotted slacker and she was like you should read this, Ethan, because you won't get off your butt and stop playing video games or reading. <laughs> so she discovered it by accident, and I really like the story. I can really relate to the characters, and a lot of kids can as well. Awesome storyline, super cool. And it was an accident how I stumbled upon the book, and the main character had a bit of a mistake, accident, good thing on in his story as well. So... Will you share your motivation for writing a story where the protagonist was kind of sort of addicted to video games? And ha have you been around middle schoolers who are hooked on video games or do you play yourself? Uh, I'm not a game. You know, I, I kind of my age would have been like the very early video games, wow. you know, like Space Invaders and that's a know, great game. Pac-Man Pac and Space stuff Invaders. like that. Right. You know? uh, but um my my son was actually the inspiration for Cameron Boxer, oh. right? Uh, not that he's a slacker, but more like, you know, kind of like a video game addicted couch potato slacker. So whenever I wrote about Cameron Boxer and his gamer friends, uh, I always kind of pictured, you know, Jay Corman in, 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 <laughs> with his Xbox Live headset, you know, kind of raging into the microphone and... and <laughs> You, you know, uh, you grew up with it, but, you know, for me, it's kind of mind blowing that, yeah. you know, you could be playing with your best friend who lives like, you know, six doors down, but you could also be playing with some 48 year old guy in Helsinki 
uh, and it's three in the morning there because this network goes absolutely everywhere. But uh, I, I would say the main inspiration for Slacker was just listening to my son and his gamer friends talk about um, talk about some of the stuff that they did and some of the uh, experiences they had gaming. And it sort of sunk in that uh, it, it's kind of it's not just a hobby it's sort of a lifestyle right like and, and that's a word that that Cameron Boxer uses all the time right that this is my lifestyle like he he wants it to be taken seriously and certainly he takes it extremely seriously um and and that was sort of where that whole slacker thing kind of began that that and th there was this one um one afternoon where my son was playing a game, you know, and there's a gigantic battle going on on the screen and he's just like losing his mind. And my wife turns to me and says, you know, when this kid's gaming, I bet the whole house could burn down and he wouldn't even notice. And uh, obviously, you know, she was kidding. <laughs> if, if you're a gamer, it's kind of a classic mom yeah. comment. But uh, I kind of took it seriously. Like, is there a way that this could happen or at least almost happen in real life and many of your stories feature misfit protagonists characters that are different from everyone else but also really lovable like the protagonists in super gifted the unteachables and a lot more what drives you to write stories with such strong yet pretty different protagonists uh i mean like i think that a lot of a lot of what i write is about is about kind of being a misfit right or, yeah. or being on the outside looking in you know um and i mean even even if you go back to like the swindle books right i mean who, who the kids on the swindle team are basically kind of the misfits of their school but there are these things that they are just absolutely awesome at and and no one else kind of kind of comes close to them and, and that's um that I guess, well, I mean, I guess I was kind of a, a misfit too. I mean, I don't think, you know, I mean to portray my childhood as, you know, I was horribly excluded from everything, but you know, I was not your average kid. Um, and underscore that with the fact that I, like, I love humor, you, you know, most of my books are funny, not all, but uh, when I was two years old, you know, the cartoons on TV that were my favorites, and we're talking what's a two-year-old going to watch, were the things that that made me laugh. So um, so I kind of felt that those characters, that that kind of, you know, like Cameron Boxer, or Noah Euclid from Ungifted and Super Gifted, or, or, you know, I mean, dozens of my books, uh, gave me an opportunity to, at one, at, on one hand, create extremely funny situations that I love, right? But also bring up some really serious issues uh, of, you know, being being excluded and being on the outside looking in and being considered sort of a misfit. Um, that's really what my, my books have been about all this time. And I also want to ask about the Super Teacher Project. I just discovered actually that you recently shared the cover reveal of your 100 first book. Wow, 101 books, that's a lot. And I just cannot wait to read your newest middle grade book. And I bet everyone watching and listening would love to hear a little bit more about the Super Teacher Project. So without giving away any spoilers, what can you share? Okay, uh, well, the Super Teacher Project, you know, book 101, is uh, coming out in January. And it's about uh, Mr. Adact, who is a new teacher, um, who arrives at a middle school and he is just, he's kind of too perfect in, in a way, right? Like he is, um, uh, you, you know, you cannot stump him with any kind of trivia. Uh, you, he knows every song lyric ever recorded. Um, if a bee gets in the class and everyone's diving under their desks, like he can literally snatch it out of the air, like with two fingers, um there is there is something up with uh mr adak and um well i guess this could be considered a bit of a spoiler but uh what it, what it is ultimately revealed to be is uh he is he is not human he is a robot but he's not a robot like i am a yeah. robot kind of you know, you know and, and i i guess the thought that that brought me to the story was just that AI is being developed to such a crazy 
crazy realistic level and advantage advances in you know robotics and and cybernetics are just are are uh are so great now could you create a a teacher who is is an actual robot uh guided by an, an artificial intelligence and no one could and no one could really tell and then also uh what 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 kind of a teacher would that teacher be you, you know um because if you think about it um AI learning tends to learn from what it's exposed to. And a middle school teacher is hanging out with a bunch of, you know, 11, 12, 13, and 14 year olds, right? So would is that AI doomed to basically become the world's the world's most technologically advanced middle schooler? Um I so it was a really cool story because on the one hand, it's got this great footing in you know the kind of middle school kind of student teacher stories that i love but it's also got some kind of larger themes like what what does it mean to be really human you seem to never run out of inspiration you, all these different and unique new story ideas that have never been well they might have been but never done to perfection like you i well, perfection because the teacher's perfect. And I bet it's gonna be a perfect book as well. That that's a really interesting concept. And yeah, that's gonna be a great book. It's well, I always knew I always knew that I that I wanted um that I wanted to take it seriously, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, the, the idea of my teacher is a robot could easily be, you know, like a very you know, I mean, very broad, silly, you know, yeah. not you know, concept. Uh, but I always knew that I wanted to to take it, but make it as realistic and believable and serious as as it could as could possibly be. Um, you know, lately I find that the best humor comes from trying not to be funny, right? Like I That's actually, funny. you know, I actually focus on the serious as much as I can and let the humor kind of come out naturally. And, and it's been really working lately. Yeah, I tend to do the opposite. I try to be funny, but it comes out like crickets. So, <laughs> well, definitely when I was younger, like I, I was all in to try and, you know, make every line absolutely hilarious. And, and um, you know, and I have to admit, I mean, when I wrote my first book, I was 12. So if you read This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall, you're it's it's written by an author who is far closer to the age of the readership than I am right now, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, you can choose my old books or my newer books, depending on which one you, you like better. That's a personal choice. But in, in terms of in terms of like cred, I mean, I think that that I probably had much better kid cred in my earlier books than I do now. Yeah. And I'm I have so I'm really curious to know. I have one question that I have been dying to know about ever since I discovered through research and scouring the internet. So I will recently watch Swindle, which was a Nickelodeon adaptation of your book, Swindle. And you, I also saw that you have quite a few TV shows or series and movies dedicated and based off of your books. Like you have This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall, those books, they have show adaptations. Well, how does it really work? Like, you, do you have a huge say in the shows or are you kind of in the background? I'm definitely in the background, you, you know, so the um, the the movie company is definitely in the in the driver's seat. Right. Uh, that's why kids are always like, oh, why don't you make a restart movie or why don't you make a masterminds movie? And it's like, you know, I, I want to, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not up to me. It's up to the the, the movie company. Um, and, and it's it's different. Right. Like um, the the McDonald Hall, like the the early Bruno and Boots books, which are now on 2B TV for for streaming. Those movies were made by, uh, you, you know, literally ex-fans you know like people who knew my books 
when they were kids and kind of grew up loving them. And when they became movie makers, you know, writers, directors, producers, uh, camera people, they, they said, you know, like, what are the books that really made me love stories? And they went back and they found these. So I, I won't say that they're exactly like the books, but the spirit of those movies is incredibly true to the spirit of those old books. Now, Nickelodeon Swindle, on the other hand, um, I mean, those guys were just so good at what they do. You know, uh, it was sort of the, you know, the gold, really the golden age of the Nickelodeon shows like iCarly and Victorious and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, and so they put together a team of writers of those kinds of books, of those kinds of TV shows, actors from those kinds of TV shows. Um and and you know directors who worked on those kinds of tv shows so i mean they they just did a beautiful job with swindle uh pretty different from what i wrote you know but uh but at the same time really uh really an excellent finished product you, you know uh in, my, my favorite sort of fun fact about it was the fact that the star of nickelodeon swindle is ariana grande it was like Seriously, uh, we kind of caught her right before she got famous. I mean, she was famous on Nickelodeon, but she wasn't this kind of yeah. international, you know, pop star that that she is today. So um, what I try to do is because I'm not in the movie business is, you know, I help when I can. I help when they want me to. Uh, but otherwise, I stay out of the way. There are so many reasons why movies and TV shows don't get made. I don't want one of those to be, you know, this annoying author just kept asking everybody extra questions yeah. and inserting himself into the process and it messed everybody up. So uh, I'm supportive. I'm a great cheerleader for it, but uh, I'm not super involved. I'm curious. I have a question about the Mastermind books. Mm -hmm. I thought I had all of them here. I guess I didn't. But I read all of them. Um, so your Mastermind books are some of my favorite of all time. They're so thrilling. The story idea, the storyline was so unique. I would have thought that I'd read something like it before, but I never really had a perfect world all in their New Mexico. Okay, I don't want to spoil it, but it's pretty pretty good read so what was the inspiration because i never really read there might have been some shows about them that i just hadn't seen but what was your inspiration for that kind of brand new pretty entertaining also interesting idea well i, I won't say personal experience right you, you know <laughs> th this yeah. is definitely not from my life but I, I guess what i was really really interested in was um was what makes us the kind of people we are, right? Like, is your personality kind of hardwired into you? You know, you're stuck with it, it's your nature, or is it nurture? Is it sort of, you know, shaped by you know, stuff, like the people you yeah. meet and the things that happen to you and, and experiences? Um, and you know how they're always on TV saying like, oh, scientists in California are performing a study, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I was like, you know, they should really do a study on this. So just for giggles, I was like, how would you do a study on that? And I started thinking about what you'd have to do. And it's like, okay, you have to really control the environment. So you need this like tiny isolated town so that people wouldn't be exposed to too much and you could really control it. And, um, and the more I thought about it, the more it started sounding like this really twisted experiment. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I got the idea for Project Osiris. Right. Which is, um, you know, in, in masterminds, the kids discover their their entire, you know, their their perfect lives are a total lie and that they they have been in this experiment since the day they were they were born. Um, incidentally, uh, you know, I know you do some writing like think about this as like a hard thing to write is how do you tell a story from the perspective of clueless people, right? Because they 
don't know anything about uh, of being part of an experiment. So how do you reveal information to the readers when the narrators themselves don't even really know it? It was really hard to write, particularly that first Masterminds book. But um, what a thrilling series to be a part of once it was all over. It was. What an ending. And also, what's really cool is having the narrators be... Like they're kind of they're clueless having clueless narrators when they discover it's kind of like you don't have a third person narrator like they live in an experiment you're first person the reader is learning along with the protagonist and that's always right. a concept that i enjoy and a lot of other people do as well because the mastermind series popular and super well deserving to be popular as well thank you and now, the next book I want to talk about, we have a lot of them, so I just want, I wanted to talk about them in a short, in a, a time span of an interview, but I still wanted to ask a couple questions about them, because it was so hard to choose what books to talk about today, but I knew I had to talk about Linked. Linked shines a light on topics like anti-Semitism, hate, and it's just, wow. I was speechless after reading your book in one sitting and it's a story that hit home for me and many others because the story features jewish protagonists their swastikas found on the walls it's just i why was there not a story like this before in the middle grade genre and it happened to be named one of Amazon's best books of 2022. It was a Sydney Taylor honor book, an NJBA winner. You know, it's pretty big when it's an acronym. And it's a Sybil Award winner. And that's all really deserving. And why, is she, why do you really decide to write about such serious and important social issues? And did any real life events motivate or influence Linked at all? Well, I mean, I guess the main inspiration was um, the the paperclip school, yeah. right in in Tennessee. Um, basically, a, a real school, Whitwell Middle School, Whitwell, Tennessee. Uh, they were doing a Holocaust unit, and they got really hung up on the number six million. And uh, their take on it was in my opinion, still like, this is genius in a way, yeah. right? Like that, that, you know, we all know what 6 million is. We all know that 6 million is a lot, but we've never actually seen what 6 million of something looks like. So best way to study the Holocaust to do justice to it is to collect 6 million of something uh, and really appreciate how huge the number is and also how enormous an event the Holocaust was. And they chose paper clips and what they discovered was even with something like paper clips where you can go to a store and buy a box of a hundred you know a hundred at a time it's still really really hard to get to uh six million paper clips and and they probably never would have made it except uh they got famous and and people started hearing about their project and sending them boxes and bags and envelopes loaded with paper clips and it went so viral that they actually ended up with uh over 30 million paper clips wow the one thing that i i never figured out in my research was like what do you do with 24 million extra paper clips that you weren't trying to collect to begin with but um that was really the inspiration for uh choke cherry middle school and the the paper chain, right? The the paper chain being, yeah. you know, no offense to paper clips, but you can buy a box of a hundred paper clips. Have you ever worked on a paper chain? Like it is, it's one link at a time. The cutting, the yeah. looping, the gluing, and I figured this out. Like a six million link paper chain, if you stretched it out, would be over three hundred miles long. Uh, in other words, Whoa. they're not going to make it, except just like those kids in in Tennessee, th they get famous. So um, on the one hand, it gives me a chance to tackle, I mean, incredibly serious and 
and topical era I- issues, right? I mean, we we see things like that in the news almost every day. Um, but at the same time, um, it, you can be pretty playful with it uh, on one side. So I think that it's not the kind of thing most of my books are about, but uh, but it was just a fantastic story uh i think for for the writing style that i have and the kind of the kind of characters and and plotting that i that i usually bring to a book it really did fit your writing style and all the books that i've read of yours and it's a good question what would you do with 24 million extra paper clips got to think about that i'll get back to well, you. I, I believe i believe i do know the answer so Oh. They did use 11 million, right? Because the, the 6 million were, oh, were yeah. the, the Jewish victims and the 5 million were the non-Jewish victims of the Holocaust. So they, they, when their paperclip project ultimately became a, a tolerance and Holocaust memorial, uh, I believe they've used the eight, they used eight, 11 million paperclips. Wow. But I mean, that's still, you have 19 million left over. What would yeah. you... Would you like you keep all of them and use them and like you have infinite paper clips basically for school like for the next hundred or two hundred or three hundred years you have paper clips for days. Well, I have to confess confess that I've never been there, so for all I know, outside of town, there's just a giant mound of, <laughs> of paper clips. I just gotta say you're an absolute legend and i'm so inspired by how your journey into books began and how you've really never stopped writing from 12 years old to you're a year older than my dad so because i know your birthday you have it on your website okay yeah however old you are um so well, 59 just... you could say it i just turned 59 okay happy birthday and... thank you my dad turned 58, so he doesn't like me talking about that, though. Um, well, if you could try your hand at any other career or job, what would you choose? So um, when I was two years old, I wanted to be a dog when I grew up. <laughs> uh, and, and that is actually not a joke. If you, you talk to my mom today, <laughs> she would tell you that when I was two, I used to eat dinner under the table because I thought you could actually become a dog through training the way you become a shortstop or a lawyer or whatever but um in in school I was never a big writing kid I or English I was always more of a math guy right math and science so I assume that if it had not been for that seventh grade English project I would probably be doing something in the in the um the science world or maybe the tech world right now so, in honor of November being the month of giving thanks, I'm asking everyone I interview, who are you most thankful for? Someone that's helped you along your journey. Well, I mean, uh, the, certainly in in my book career, m- my mom has been the, the the number one. I, you know, n- no disrespect to my my seventh grade English teacher, the track coach, but yeah. uh, y- you know, I mean, she has been the person who has helped me the most over the years. And and I guess it kind of makes sense when you think of, oh, he wrote his first book when he was 12. Like, who's going to help? Mom! Yeah. Uh, but, but even today, you know, and my mom's in her 80s. And, you know, the first thing I do when I write something is I email it up to my mom in Canada. And, and when I have a problem, she's the first person I go to. You know, when I have an idea, we we kind of hash it out together. So she's really been the person that has kind of made this happen for me. Like, if, if you really think about it, it's pretty weird and unlikely that this random kind of English assignment that I got in the 70s, you know, is still is still my life, right? Like I'm still doing at 59 what I did when when I was 12. And that is, that's just really lucky. You, you know, like that doesn't happen that much. So um, so Thanksgiving is, is kind of a great time for me to reflect on that. I mean, certainly when the fort came out and there was all the big hoopla about like, oh, book 100, um, it, I started to think that if I could somehow go back to that seventh grade class and whisper in the ear of 12 year old me, who's working on book one, right? That one day yeah. there's going to be book 100. I think that would have been, you know, really, really something. 
Yeah, that's so sweet that you have such a great connection with your mom. I hope that uh, one day I'll have that with my mom. I hope she's listening to this. She's pretty. She's <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure it'll happen. And it's I that would be I want. What do you think that 12 year old you would say, like in response to you being like, you're going to write 100 books? Uh, Probably something like, uh, teacher, there's this weird old <laughs> guy molesting me and talking about weird stuff um you know honestly like if i had a chance to go back to to my 12 year old self the, the one thing that i would really change is i try to tell myself to be less impatient because you, you know like what i went through like publishing a book as a kid and really launching a career as a, a you know young teenager um that's really something pretty cool. Like a, a lot of great yeah. things were happening for me. But when I think back to those times, what I mostly remember is being unimaginably impatient. Like everything took forever. And it did, right? Like mm -hmm. I wrote my first book when I was 12. When did I sign a contract? I was 13 by then. When did it come out? I was 14. I'd started high school. You, you know, um, which is not really that long for those things to happen yeah. in, in publishing, right? But for a kid, it felt like everything took absolutely forever, right? So yeah. if I could go back to talk to my 12-year-old self, I would be like, you know, just chill out and enjoy it. Like something really, really cool is happening right, right now. Don't constantly be spending your time agonizing over why is this taking so long? Yeah, I, I think that, any kid would need that from their future self because I've never met a single kid who's like, okay, two years isn't a very long time. Yeah. Like, because exactly. compared to your lifespan, like you've lived 12, 12 years, two years is a sixth of your entire life. It feels like forever. Absolutely. Yeah. And now it's time for the final question. The question I ask every single person I interview, if you could be or meet any literary character, fictional or real, it could be your favorite author or it could be your favorite book character. Who would it be and why? You know, um, I'm a huge fan of the original The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to necessarily say, oh, I'd love to meet, you know, Zaphod Beeblebrox yeah. one day, but, but, <laughs> but, you know, just, just to be sort of a fly on the wall. I've heard all kinds of different things. I'm not sure I have the story straight. Like it might have started as like a series of radio plays on the BBC and then become a book. Uh, but I would just love to meet like Douglas Adams and and talk about how, the experience of, first of all, how you make, you know, a five or six book trilogy to begin with. But, yeah. uh, but also, um, you know, uh, it, it's so funny and there are so many kind of classic stand the test of time, you, you know, kind of moments in it. Uh, you know, so often you sort of think, oh, I wish I had my towel, you know, and, 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 and things directly from it, that it, it kind of becomes, it kind of becomes a part of your life. You, you know, it, it becomes yeah. part of the the lens in which you you view the world. And that's the kind of thing I would hope that my own books would kind of contribute to people that, you, you know, they would they would look at their lives as they grow up through, you know, through things that they picked up from, you know, from Slacker or Restart or Masterminds or, or you know, even one of the, the older books. A lot of the readers of my first books are, like reasonably old now, you know, because they came out so long ago. So um, I got to go with something connected to Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide. Gordon Coleman is truly a mastermind when it comes to middle grade books. Thank you so much for joining me today, Gordon. It's been All right, a thanks country. for having me. This has been fun. It has. And I cannot wait to read the Super Teacher Project, book 101. I'm now going to know which book you, number all of your books are now because the four was 100. Now just keep counting up. And yeah, I hope you have a great day. And everybody listening, you have to read Gordon Coleman's books. Like I cannot tell you enough. They're middle grade le legendary.
Stay safe, keep reading, and I'll see you in the next one, everybody. Bye.